Hello and welcome to Keeping It Clean in 2015, What's Bugging You This Fall? Dealing with Small Flies and Cockroaches. We would like to start off with a short video. And now I would like to introduce your moderator for today, Jennifer Williams, Marketing Communications Manager, Ecolab Pest Elimination. Jennifer, you now have the floor. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending time with us today. I have Dr. John Barquet with me to discuss small flies and cockroaches in food service facilities. Dr. Barquet is a senior scientist at Ecolab, the world's leading provider of cleaning, food safety, and infection prevention products and services. Dr. Barquet has a PhD in urban entomology and leads Ecolab Pest Elimination's product evaluation and development projects, specializing in developing effective, integrated pest management programs that deliver high-quality pest protection while limiting environmental impact. He is an expert on a wide range of pest elimination techniques for food and beverage processing, food service, hospitality, and related industries. Please take it away, Dr. Barquet. Thank you, Jen, very much, and welcome, everybody. Uh, for this Keep It Clean series, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the delicious subject here of small flies and cockroaches in food service facilities. And while it does say in food service facilities, uh, much of the information I talk about can be applied to other segments, uh, food retail, food and beverage processing, et cetera, uh, wherever there's the possibility of, of having these pests, and we'll go through what those conducive conditions are for each. So for the agenda today, uh, starting out with small flies, uh, we'll be going over biology and behavior. What are the food safety considerations for these, these flies? Uh, what, are, what are the conducive conditions? Why are they here? And then what are the prevent, prevention and action steps that you can take as well as your pest management provider? So talking about small flies, uh, there's a variety of these that uh, uh, we call them small because they're much smaller than house flies. Uh, and uh, they do, uh, they can breed indoors. Uh, most are capable of coming in from the outside, but these flies in particular are capable of breeding indoors, which makes them quite different from the common house flies or field flies 
which usually are not doing that. Today we are going to focus more on the fruit fly and in more specifically the dark-eyed fruit fly, which has become a problem in food service and other type facilities over the last uh, 10 years or so. They've really uh, become more of a problem. Uh, but there can be forward flies. I'll make a little mention of those. Uh, those are called humpbacked or drain flies, and they can be a particular problem in, uh, in, in with broken drain lines and such. Moth flies, typically not a huge issue. They tend to stay very close to their breeding source, so places like sump pumps, very moist areas where there's uh, uh, decaying organic matter and such, but they don't tend to move very far from their breeding source. And then there are fungus gnats, and fungus gnats, are generally not considered a sanitation pest. More often they're associated with plantings, interior plantscapes, overwatered plants and such. But these are the ones that we most commonly see with the uh, fruit fly being, being the most uh, problematic. And um, they're capable of being year-round pests, although we do see them reduce uh, in the colder climates over the winter time. Uh, and they, they are associated with unsanitary uh, conditions and excessive moisture. So uh, it's easier said than done just to clean, but we'll get into some of the steps that, that can be taken. Uh, uh, they are capable of spreading pathogens. We've done some research uh, specifically on the fruit fly, uh, which uh, show that it's very capable of doing that. And then common pests, uh, you know, basically they're very common in food handling facilities, and they have huge breeding potential. Uh, the life cycle, well, they start out as eggs. And uh, these are quite small, difficult to see, and they're typically laid in biofilm materials where something's fermenting. Then it gets to the, uh, the maggot phase, uh, which is hidden in the biofilms, and it serves as an area of protection as well as nutrition for the small flies. And then the puparium, which is a dormant phase, and then the adult emerges from there. And it's about three weeks from the egg to the adult. Adult flies, in the case of the dark-eyed fruit fly, can live more than four weeks and females can live up to, uh, lay up to 100 eggs per day. So populations can grow very quickly once they become established. So there is seasonal pressure. As I mentioned, they can occur year round, uh, but especially uh, with these flies that are breeding indoors, as floor temperatures begin to drop, which is a common area where they can breed, drains and other stagnant areas around floors, we do see their populations drop, uh, drop with those temperatures. And temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit are very ultimate uh, for them. They, they do very well. When it starts getting below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, they have difficulty reproducing. So obviously we're concerned about brand protection uh, and uh, fruit flies and such can often be viewed as just a nuisance pest, uh, but some people will take it beyond that, especially when we start talking about cockroaches. Uh, we don't want those things getting out onto social media and places like that. So. Uh, food safety awareness is important. We'll be covering that. Uh, health departments, depending on where you are, uh, may rate these uh, differently in terms of their importance and your score on your on your scores on your health score. Information is readily available, of course, on these uh, social media sites. So it's something that we want to we want to have our eyes on very carefully today. In terms of food safety considerations, again, these flies are breeding indoors in unsanitary conditions. Uh, trash receptacles, uh, dirty drains, uh, standing water, mop heads and such, and you can imagine the types of bacterial loads those, those have. Uh, they do tend to rest away from the breeding sites, and this can be misleading, but they are capable of carrying pathogens with them. And then uh, we're going to talk about how they transfer these around with their, with their body parts, their mouth parts and such, and uh, they do leave characteristic spotting and such where they've been landing, so we'll review these, these telltale signs. They have a potential to spread disease, and I want to say potential, uh, just because they're carrying uh, 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 bacteria around doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be spreading uh, pathogenic type bacteria, but there certainly is the potential for them to do it, just as it is with silk flies. So there are mechanical transmission, uh, transmitters rather, of these uh, pathogens. So their mouth parts and their tarsi or their feet are the primary culprits. And we'll start with the mouth. Uh, obviously they, they have to feed on liquid, and so they, they, uh, uh, they'll feed the liquid, but they can drop bacteria off and, and carry it off with their mouth parts. And shown here is a ceiling tile, and what you can see here are actually the fruit flies themselves these little dark uh, objects here, but you see this spotting. Now this is what we call fly speck, 
and it's produced by these flies as they land, and it's a telltale sign that there either is an existing infestation or at one time there was. They do like to rest up high during the day, over 60% of the time, and that can be on the ceilings and the upper walls. So this object looks a little strange, but this is the small fly tarsus, or foot of the small fly. And you got the tarsal claw as well as the pulvillus, and these are what they use to land, and they are capable of landing on any surface upside down. They're perfectly comfortable doing that. And as you can see, there's little suction cups down here in the pulvillus, which helps them to land and hold on to smooth surfaces. It also helps them to pick things up. So what I'd like to do now is show a video of the grooming behavior of the small fly. And uh, we talked about the tarsus coming down and what they'll typically do, they don't like to get things on them. They do actually clean themselves all the time. So when they get material on them, they, they exhibit this grooming behavior. I'm gonna show you a portion of a video here. Generally, the grooming behavior starts with the front feet, uh, but we've missed that part. I didn't want to have you watch uh, the full video here for three minutes, but you'll get an idea. We put some fluorescent dye on this fruit fly, and what you can see is it's a powder that the fly is grooming off and uh, depositing onto the surface. So uh, let's say that this wasn't the, the, the dye itself, but it was the, uh, the pathogens. That's how they deposit these onto a surface. Okay, so in terms of transferring microorganisms, we have conducted research uh, at Ecolab uh, with our entomology and our microbiology departments working together. And what we've done is experiments uh, uh, basically with these flies, and we have their, their breeding source here and shown in container A. Container A is the control, and what I mean by that is their food source is not contaminated with a bacteria, in this case salmonella. And then we've got container B. Again, we've got the, the uh, breeding source of the fruit fly here, this vial. And then their feeding material here was contaminated with a load of salmonella. And this was a, a St. Paul strain. And then we placed these selected Petri dishes on the back wall as well as the floor to detect the presence of the bacteria. Now you can see in the control chamber there was no bacteria transfer because there was no bacteria on the food source. Uh, however, in the uh, container B, we see these little spots on the, on the dishes. And what these are, each one of these is a footprint of the uh, small fly. So when it uh, landed, it deposited the bacteria. Much more depositing on the vertical surfaces because, again, they do prefer to land on the walls as well as ceilings and not so much on the floor. But you can see very well that they do transmit uh, these bacteria. So again, looking at a scanning electron microscope, a photograph of the tarsi, this time quite a bit more up close. You can see in this case the fruit fly has picked up some biomass and there's actually a bacterial spore present on the tarsal claw. And then looking at the seti or the hairs on the tarsus, we can see more bacteria that's been picked up and actually gets lodged. These spores actually get lodged into the hairs of the, uh, of the tarsus, so very easily for them to transport. So those are the food safety considerations. Very important to consider that. So they're not just a nuisance. Uh, they are something that uh, we need to be concerned with from a food safety standpoint. And what are the conducive conditions? Well, in this picture, if you look closely, you can see the small flies on the surface of the tile here, and there's many of them. This is typically what we will see, but this is not the breeding source. The breeding source is a biofilm somewhere. It can be in drains, but in many other locations in the restaurants soda pop dispensers, uh, we'll get into a lot of the different examples and such where they can be breeding. This is, the, it looks like slime, but it's a biofilm and the maggots here are using that as a source of nutrition as well as protection. And I just want to illustrate that bleach does not work. If you put bleach down the drain, the, the, the maggots will recess into the biofilm. So uh, again, not a good idea to put uh, bleach down drains for the purpose of small flies. So when we get into some of the restaurant facilities, this is obviously an older facility and the bar area, very common area for these small flies to be breeding. Uh, it's the real bar fly, I guess you could say. But uh, you can see that we're getting corrosion around the beer taps and such, this green material, and we're gonna get fluids seeping in underneath here. Those are perfect for breeding areas for small flies. We've got broken floor tile and, and, and areas where we've got organic matter accumulating. 
So uh, lots of opportunities for small flies here to, to breed, and we do see them oftentimes in large numbers in the bar area. So it's very important to try and keep these areas in good repair, such as there's no seepage, leakage, and uh, keep them clean. And this is where we get into food debris uh, being cooked, uh, kicked in under cook lines. And this was one of the few restaurants I've been in where we actually had filled flies breeding indoors because they were uh, uh, basically feeding on the decaying meat that was under the cook line here. So you can see some of us are, or all of us are wearing respirators as the odor was quite bad, but huge flies uh, population within this facility. And then uh, another area where they can be very attracted to is the storage area. They like onions and bananas and things like that, so it's important to have these screened on top, protected so that we don't get flies in, uh, in to uh, contaminate those areas. Skip a little fast there, back up here. Garbage storage, obviously we've got, uh, we've got some opportunity here. Uh, it's overflowing, we've got leaks. And this is uh, something where the flies will breed in the bottom of the trash containers. And you can see we've got spillage here in the bottom of the container with plenty of opportunity for the flies to breed. Ripening bananas, very common practice for making banana bread. Uh, those that should be enclosed, enclosed within a container that has a fine mesh screen so we keep the flies out. We've all eaten our fair share of fruit fly eggs in our time. Just uh, thought I'd throw that little fact out there. And then drains, very common areas for, for uh, uh, biofilm. This is what's called a sugar snake, and this was blown out of an ice machine. And a sugar snake is simply a large mass of biofilm being produced by bacteria. And then we've got opportunities with moth storage, things like that. This is a fruit fly inside a beer tap drain, showing it rearing its ugly little head there. And here we've got different, we've got leaking beverage lines with fun, fungus forming. This is a blue fungus that's uh, forming, and then we've got masses of fruit fly pupa on top of that. Uh, this is a beverage holster and uh, dispensing holster, and we actually have uh, pupa uh, of the flies within there. And then garbage disposal. We get leaky garbage disposals. All of these produce fluids, uh, and then, the, of course, the leaky beverage lines here for the flies to breed in. Here's a close-up of pupa on one of the leaking beverage lines. And then uh, certainly uh, when we have a lot of leaking water, broken floor tile, places like that, these are areas also that they breed. They do breed under the mats, so the mats should be cleaned on a regular basis and keep those floors in good condition and your equipment in good condition such that we don't get the water accumulation and fermenting organic matter. Just another example, I'm sorry these slides, these slides like to skip ahead on me, but uh, we've got standing water here uh, and the uh, situation with, that we need to avoid. Now these are forward flies, and forward flies are a little different than the fruit fly. They can breed in much more sewer-like conditions, and when we see them coming up around expansion joints and places like that, we've got a real problem. Uh, it's not something where they're breeding at the top of the drain like the dark-eyed fruit fly is. They're breeding probably from a broken, broken sewer line. So the floor needs to be excavated and it needs to be repaired is the ultimate solution for these. So when we see these, we do get particularly worried, especially when they're in large numbers and we're having difficulty finding the source. So what can we do? Well, keep your drains clean weekly. Uh, you, you don't need to go all the way down into the drain and clean the P-trap and such like that, but the upper portion of the drain, especially there is a rim in these commercial drains and kitchens where fruit, food debris and such can, can build up, that's where the fruit flies are primarily breeding. So you're going to want to get, uh, and, fun, and, and other types of small flies will be in this area. So clean the grate real good with the uh, industrial detergent, and uh, then, then clean out all the food debris here. Try to do that on a weekly basis. And again, avoid putting uh, uh, potent drain cleaners down there and, and chlorine, because these can be risky to use for your staff and don't really solve the problem. And then we talked about the floors, so the floors are very important. We've also talked about different types of equipment. So clean the floors on, uh, every day, of course. Uh, fresh food debris isn't going to be as uh, attractive to the flies as something that begins to ferment. So the better you can keep up on this, uh, it's great. Uh, we do find that power washers are sometimes damaging tile and grout and actually making the situation worse 
by blasting food debris in behind uh, areas that make it difficult to access. So simple scrub brush uh, mopping techniques are preferred over using those. And then your pest management provider can do a variety of things for you, uh, certainly help to identify the source of where these flies are coming from, and then they can provide a variety of services. Uh, we've got a couple of services that we provide from Ecolab. One is our SWAT service, where we will go in and actually do the cleaning for the customer and use sanitizers and such to, uh, to, to those areas. Uh, we also have a targeted service where we will actually target the soils where the flies are breeding should they be difficult to access for cleaning. Let's face it, there's some drains, there's some cleaning areas that are difficult to access, difficult to clean on a regular basis. So these can actually be treated legally with certain forms of pesticide to eliminate the life stages of the small fly. And again, that is your pest service provider that should be making these insecticide applications. You should not have your, your, your staff doing that. So prevention and action steps, minimize exterior breeding opportunities. And uh, so close those garbage receptacles, eliminate the standing water, uh, seal all doors, and minimize the amount of time the doors are left open because these flies can come in from the outside. And then inspect incoming goods. You know, definitely you're going to be rejecting things that have spoilage, but though that is what the small flies are attracted to uh, is the spoiling uh, fruits and vegetables. And then minimize those breeding sites, get that standing water out of there as best you can, and good cleaning practices to remove the biofilm. Uh, uh, and there are certain products, uh, certain sanitizers and such that can kill bioform kill, uh, forming bacteria. Uh, repair those structural deficiencies and store perishables in closed plastic tubs. And then very important to partner with your pest management provider to address these small fly issues. It's easier said than done to do some of this cleaning. And that is because the, 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 the source, the root cause, may be difficult to identify and you need to work together on that. So this is the way we like to see them. All right. And so uh, we'll move on now to cockroaches. And this is something we're basically going to cover the same, same areas that we covered for the small flies. What are the species that we're interested in? Uh, get into some biology behavior, signs, what we look for when it comes to these pests, root causes, and of course the food safety considerations of cockroaches. What are the conducive conditions? And then what can we do about them? So cockroaches have been on the planet for a very long time, uh, since around the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, pictured here is a Suriname cockroach. Suriname cockroach is a cockroach that was around at the time of the dinosaurs and it's virtually unchanged. It's a very primitive species, it's a soil dwelling species. Occasionally we find them in planters, but they're all female. There's no sexual reproduction, so they basically are making clones of themselves. So they are survivors. They've been around for a long time. Uh, currently we've got around 3,500 known species worldwide, probably more, especially in the tropics. And in North America, we've got about 77 or so species with only 12 considered to be pests. So that helps to put that in perspective. And uh, uh, poor flight, most of them are losing their ability to fly and becoming very well adapted to crawling and, and running. Uh, they lack social behavior, which doesn't mean that they don't have a life, but they uh, do not make nests or, uh, or share food. They're uh, pretty much every cockroach for themselves. And photonegative means they don't like the light, so they tend to be nocturnal and uh, uh, don't come out. Let's say in the case of the German cockroach, you usually don't see them until the lights go out at night. And omnivorous, again, they're survivors, so they're very capable of eating a, a wide variety of food for survival. So uh, basically the main species that we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on the German cockroach. That's the number one in the food industry, our bread and butter bug, if you will. And then uh, it, it is a domestic species. Absolutely has to have people to survive. You will not find it uh, even in vacant buildings. It, with, it needs the food, the water, and the harborage that people provide. And then there's the brown banded. This is another domestic species, but we don't see this as commonly in the food industry. It's more of a residential pest. So we'll see this in apartments uh, and places like that. And then we've got the larger paradomestic species, which for those of you that live in the southern tier of the United States or more tropical areas, you know these dial the phone. These are large cockroaches. These are living outside, but we call them paradomestic because they can take advantage of our habitat 
and come indoors, usually not nesting indoors, but sometimes they can. And we'll, we'll cover a few of these uh, which are the most important, and that would be most common is the American, and then the, uh, the Oriental cockroach as the uh, two most common that we see. So let's start with the German cockroach, and this is the most important one for us to focus on uh, for keeping it clean. And uh, widely distributed throughout the world, and it's a relatively small species, and um, found anywhere indoors but prefers very warm and humid areas. Even though it has fully developed wings as an adult, it does not fly. And the female, she will carry the egg capsule with her. This is her egg capsule that has between 38, 30 to 48 eggs within that capsule, which is the most of any of the pest species. And adults can live uh, three to four months, maybe a little bit longer than that, but they don't tend to survive much beyond that. And the life cycle really can vary depending on temperature between 54 and 25, 200, you know, 250 days or so between uh, uh, egg and adult. So the main stages here are the egg, the nymph, and there are several uh, sizes of nymphs before they finally molt into the adult stage. This is a, a male over here, and then the larger uh, gravid or pregnant female. And uh, populations are composed of about 75% nymphs, so they're mostly the young. And uh, if all, and if you did some math and calculated how many cockroaches could come from a single pair, at the end of a year, uh, studies at Purdue University showed that uh, doing some some studies in large chambers that they wound up with about a quarter million cockroaches after one year. So very capable of reproducing very quickly. Now the American cockroach, uh, very common in the southern United States. Uh, it's only indoors. Uh, where I'm from here in Minnesota, we find it on university campus steam tunnels and places like that. Uh, but again, likes it very hot and humid. In the south, they've got a variety of nicknames for it, the palmetto bug. And I guess that's because we don't want to scare away the tourists. Uh, and they're also water bugs. So we get these common names. But it's an American cockroach. It didn't come from America. In fact, all of the pest species of cockroaches, and even uh, when we start talking about rodents, the roof rat, Norway rat, the house mouse, all of our vermin were brought in with the early French and Spanish explorers. So we can blame uh, Christopher Columbus for the, uh, for the American cockroach here. But um, they're large. Uh, they do fly. And it's uh, rather weak flight, but they're capable of, of doing that. They're very common around the perimeter of facilities, uh, and they do reside in sewers and basements, places, uh, again, where it's humid, and, and they can eat uh, just about anything, so they're, they're not picky eaters. Um, and then they, uh, they actually will uh, attach their egg cases to surfaces before they hatch, and then, then the eggs hatch within six to eight weeks, and much longer life cycle than the German cockroach, and the adults can live uh, about a year or so. so uh, and then they can go a relatively long period of time without food and a uh, period of time without water. So pretty, pretty hardy bugs, and uh, we consider them to be oftentimes a nuisance, but because of their size, uh, people uh, obviously don't want to have these around, especially in a food service facility. And here you can see them emerging from drains. So they can come from the sewer system and up through the drains of the facility in certain situations. The oriental cockroach is probably the most common in Europe. Uh, we do see that here in North America, but it's much more common in Europe. Uh, even I've even been told it's more common than the German cockroach in some places. Uh, it looks like a big black beetle. This is a female, and she doesn't have any wings. Even as an adult, she just has uh, these wing pads, so people mistaken them for beetles and such. Uh, and then the males have wings, but they do not fly. And they survive very well outdoors, uh, mulchy areas. They still like it nice and humid, but a little cooler than the uh, larger, uh, the other uh, paradomestic species. And they enter structures and groups, uh, you know, gaps and such, uh, thresholds, utility pipes. And they feed on all kinds of food. So again, uh, they're, they're omnivorous. And they have a large odor uh, when, they're, uh, when there are a few in the population. And uh, most cockroaches do, and that's actually a pheromone. Uh, that's associated with their aggregation. So other paradomestic species just to touch on, uh, the Australian, the, sm the brown, the smoky brown, all are uh, considered paradomestic pests. The Pennsylvania woods cockroach is the only one that's really considered native to North America. It, the, the males are strong flyers, the females don't have wings, but they're very attracted to light at night. And if people have their windows open, especially in wooded areas, uh, this can become a problem. Uh, they can be brought in with firewood and such like that, but not as, not really considered the health pests that these 
other uh, cockroaches can be. So uh, in terms of biology behavior, they're comfortable being in large groups. Uh, and then they call them palmetto bugs because they do very commonly reside in, in the tops of palm trees. And this is the way we like to see our kitchens. They're not always this clean, but this is an example of a very clean kitchen uh, where conducive conditions for cockroaches are, are largely reduced. So in terms of the German cockroach in food service facilities, uh, we, there's, there's telltale signs that we look for, but it can be a year-round pest we do see populations reduced in the wintertime uh, in, the, in the colder climates uh, associated with unsanitary conditions, and they are capable of spreading pathogens, just like we talked about with the small flies, and we know very well with fruit flies, uh, I'm sorry, with, with silt flies. Common pests of food service and other food handling facilities, and uh, the German cockroach has huge breeding potential. So this is the life cycle of the German cockroach. So it starts out with the egg capsule. The nymphs hatch out, and there's six or so instars, as we call them. They just get bigger. And then they get to, to the adult stage, and they're sexually mature. They've got wings and are capable of reproducing. We call this simple metamorphosis because the life stages resemble the adults. They just don't have wings. So very similar in appearance. Okay, so what do we look for? Well, we look at the live cockroaches themselves, obviously. This is a cockroach monitor, and what those are are tools that the pest management industry uses to detect and uh, monitor the cockroaches within a facility. And it has an attractant tablet here that attracts the cockroaches into the monitor. And you can see we've captured a variety of life stages uh, within this monitor, so we look for those. Well, obviously, we're gonna look for the egg capsules themselves, and this is a cast skin. So cast skins are basically after the molting process, this is what's left behind. And then the feces, or the droppings, resemble pepper. And there is a characteristic, characteristic odor associated with German cockroach infestations. Oftentimes when we go in and do our inspections, we will have the lights out when we enter uh, because the cockroaches are more likely to be running about in the darkness. So that's just a, a little hint there. Root causes of cockroaches, they're great hitchhikers. They're very good at coming in on shipments and other materials. Uh, they can come in with your employees, the backpacks, should they be in a situation where they live in an apartment or something that has a cockroach issue. Uh, they do like wooden, mater or wooden material and cardboard material, very, very attracted to those types of things that can be brought in. And then they can come in with customers or patrons in restaurants. And uh, some of them, uh, such as the paradomestic species, can be attracted to building lights, and these would be the outdoor breeders. And just an example of poor sanitation, and what we have here is very greasy buildup within a kitchen. And I bring this up because many kitchens, especially those dealing with a lot of fried foods, are going to have a greasy deposit on many surfaces within their facility. This makes it a challenge from the standpoint of not just a food source for the cockroaches, but also many of the pesticides that are used today in the pest control industry, we don't have as many as we used to. We don't have access to as many because of tight regulations. And many of them get bound by this grease. So if we were to come in and make an application to this area, the grease or the fat will bind those insecticides so tightly that they're not available to the insect to be picked up. So just working with the pest management provider, they're probably gonna make some recommendations relative to cleaning and trying to reduce the amount of grease load on surfaces. And again, easier said than done, but uh, this is an example of frequently what we see in terms of grease buildup and difficult to access areas uh, as well. Then we've got practices that happen within food service facilities. And of course, you do need to, uh, in some cases, keep your paperwork for a number of years. Uh, but this makes it difficult for access and cockroaches love this paper material here in a booth. So this is a bad practice, and I, I recommend that you do not store your, your paper uh, files and such within the booths. Keep those open, keep them clean. It's not just important from the standpoint of cockroaches, but also rodents. Rodents like to get into these void areas and access them for their food tidbits. So this is a thing to, to keep in mind. Also, construction of your facility. Uh, of course, keeping it in good repair, but be careful when remodeling and such that we're not producing layers of material. 
such as the uh, FRP or that white plastic that goes up in the back of a restaurant, layers will make it very difficult to access those cockroach populations. So keep it in good repair and uh, make it so there's as few layers as possible and your pest management provider has access to get to the cockroaches. So in terms of the importance of cockroaches in food safety, this is the German cockroach, and just like with the small flies we talked about, these are mechanical carriers of disease. So we're going to talk about the same thing that we saw with the small flies. We know the German cockroach is capable of picking up a variety of pathogens, you know, bacteria, viruses, and such. They're also associated with allergens. In fact, uh, many allergy tests do test for German cockroach allergy. Uh, for people living uh, with cockroach infestations in their home, they can become allergic to them over time. So that's another problem that we see with especially the German cockroach. And then they can contaminate food and preparation surfaces, bodies, shed skin, and their droppings. And they've been associated with a variety of foodborne pathogens, as you can see listed there, as well as many other pathogens. So. Uh, very important uh, to uh, consider that as, as, as part of a pest program. This is considered to be a very important pest by health inspectors, and there are some places, some uh, municipalities, counties within the United States where they will shut down a restaurant for one cockroach, one German cockroach, alive or dead. So you know, you know where you are if that's happening. <laughs> so this is the foot or the tarsus of the German cockroach. And we're going to zoom in on the very end of the tarsal claw here using scanning electron microscopy. We're up to about 2,000 times magnification, and you can see some stuff on the end of that claw. And then moving in, we see some rod-shaped uh, organisms here. It's, you can't really tell what the species is, but definitely that cockroach has picked up some bacteria and is capable of carrying that around. So in terms of prevention and control, Inspect the incoming items for, uh, uh, for cockroaches and their signs. Good sanitation, uh, reduce the amount of available food and water. And uh, exclusion, now it's really difficult to exclude cockroaches from a facility. It's difficult to keep them from coming in or being brought in, of course. But in the cases of the larger species of cockroaches coming in, there may be opportunities for you to do some exclusion work. Uh, door sweeps for rodents and such will help with that and uh, other, other things that can be done to minimize the gaps around the building where they might be coming in. Now, chemical control will be something that your pest management provider should be doing. There's a variety of tools available to them, but uh, there's more than just the chemical control to eliminating German cockroaches. So correct those structural deficiencies. We showed you a lot of examples for the small flies, but those can also be conducive for the cockroaches, especially where we might have difficult access to where they may be residing. And then keep that sanitation as best as possible. It doesn't take very much to feed a cockroach. And then communication between yourself and the pest management provider is critical. They should be writing you good service reports uh, with detailing where they found issues in terms of structure and sanitation. Uh, documenting any insect activity that they've had, and then what particular insecticide products have they been applying and where. So they keep, need to keep their material safety data sheets, uh, a log book so that your staff can uh, log where they've seen sightings, so you're keeping in constant communication and keeping on top of the cockroaches. And then employee awareness, there's training that can be provided from your pest management provider, how to identify cockroaches. Oftentimes it's a misidentification. It's not a cockroach, it's something else that they've seen, and they, sh they should be able to educate staff uh, on site on how to do that. And then there's something we call IPM, or insect pest management. So, I'm gonna just move, move to the next. Hey, are there, I think we've lost a slide here, but that's okay. I lost my slide on, on IPM, but insect pest management is something that, um, uh, uh, or IPM integrated pest management, is something that uses a variety of approaches. So we've talked about chemical control, but uh, before that there's non-chemical things we can do, so the cleaning, the structure, the sanitation, and then monitoring for those populations. So there's certain facilities where we might not be able to make an insecticide application until there's evidence or there's actual activity. So we monitor for those 
and then ultimately pesticides being used judiciously. It's crack and crevice, so it goes where the cockroaches are. And then we uh, uh, basically don't, we're not spraying pesticides all over the place that we used to, it's very targeted. So using a variety of tools to go after the, after the cockroach, and really we can eliminate German cockroaches. We can get down to zero for them, but uh, it's something where we need to be working in partnership. Okay, great. So before we begin our Q&A, we wanted to remind everyone that September is National Food Safety Month. All month long, we are sharing food safety advice, best practices, tips, and more through our Twitter and Facebook accounts. Follow our pages for great updates from our experts. Plus, each week we're giving away food safety prizes. Last week we gave out Ecolab digital thermometers, and this week we've just posted the next opportunity. The first five people to comment on our recent post with a food safety fact will win an Ecolab cutting board. Stay tuned for more chances to win this month and for more food safety updates. So it does look like we have uh, some questions in queue, so if you haven't already, please go ahead and submit your questions and we will begin. The first question here is, I have been experiencing an increase in fruit fly activity in coffee kiosks. Why would that be a breeding area? Great question. In fact, uh, fruit flies are very common in coffee shops. And uh, for some, some reason, they love fermenting coffee grounds. So we've seen this. And what happens is when the coffee is being uh, disposed of, there's oftentimes a receptacle, and then we're getting spillage of the coffee grounds around the trash container. And uh, if those get wet, if those get uh, any water on them, they'll begin to ferment, and they become a very prime breeding ground. So make sure the coffee grounds are going in the trash and they're not going, uh, going anywhere else. Keep the cracks and crevices around those areas clean from the coffee grounds. Um, and really also coffee shops oftentimes have these syrups that can be very uh, attractive to the, to, the, to the fruit flies. So make sure we keep that spillage uh, minimized so we're not providing those areas. You know, coffee, uh, coffee shops have this problem and uh, we, need to, we need to be uh, keeping our eye on where those coffee grounds are going. Okay, great. Next up, donut cases, with cases, donut cases which have little to no moisture are an area of fruit fly activity. Do you have any suggestions on prevention? Yes, we've seen this a lot in uh, food retail. Uh, in fact, when we've done uh, transfer studies and we're getting ready to, to publish some more uh, research that we've done, we use donuts as an attractant. In fact, we found it's very difficult to have a better attractant than a donut to a fruit fly. And uh, of course, there's yeasts and such associated with donuts, but they are very attracted to donut cases and solutions that we've come up with for those is to install a small fan that provides a uh, negative air pressure, not positive air pressure, it sounds weird. You don't want to be blowing the odor of the uh, donut out. Rather, you want to be sucking the odor of the donut within the case so that the fruit flies are no longer detecting the odor. And that's something you need to work with your engineering or facilities uh, associates to get that installed and get it, uh, it doesn't have to be a, a fast moving fan. It just has to have negative air pressure such that you're pulling the air into the donut uh, uh, casing at a, at a low rate, but at such a rate that the odor of the donuts is not uh, becoming uh, attractive to the fruit flies on the outside. So that takes a little bit of creative work and somebody that would know how to put that in, but we found that that is a good solution. Okay, great. The next question, I've noticed the smoky brown in my store back room storage areas usually in the general merchandise storage area that houses deodorants and lotions that doesn't seem like a real food source. Can you explain? Yes, yeah, so, you know, it's difficult to know without going and doing an inspection, but you're right, that's not gonna be something that's a good food source. But they can live a while uh, away from that. So uh, again, working with your pest management provider to find root cause, because somehow they are getting in there. Uh, I doubt that they're being brought in with anything, they're coming in from the outside. And the smoky brown cockroach is just like the American cockroach. It's going to be coming in from around the perimeter. Uh, they do like to get into crawl spaces and attics. And uh, so there's other areas they can get through. 
And cockroaches are very good about crawling along plumbing and conduits and places like that. So all of those need to be inspected on how they may be getting in. And especially around the perimeter of your facility when you're dealing with these paradomestic cockroaches, keep the landscaping to the point where your mulch is no thicker than two inches. Uh, you've got preferably a gravel barrier around the immediate perimeter so we don't have uh, the foliage and such going right up against the building and the, the plantings and such, uh, ivy, whatever it might be, isn't so thick that uh, you're, you're not getting access to where the cockroaches could be. So good landscaping practices will also help to minimize these par paradomestic cockroaches from getting inside. Sorry, I can't be more precise on that, but I'd actually have to probably go on site to see what's going on. Okay, the next question, fruit, flies, and bar drains. So what kind of eco-friendly solution can be used? Well, obviously we're talking about uh, cleaning, and that's something that can be done with a, with a regular detergent. Um, and so you want to you wanna remove that soil right around, right, right around that area. But what happens, they can get into some of these drain lines. So if you have a, uh, a line coming from, say, we, we showed an example of an ice machine, uh, but they need the bar drain lines. Those may need to be flushed, where you have some water pressure from above and you can blow out those sugar snakes. Um, there are some bacterial as well as enzymatic cleaners that can be used, and these, these rely on enzymes as well as bacteria to eat the soils and, uh, you know, the, the, fat, the fat, the lipid soils, the protein soils. They take a while to work, uh, but they're uh, in some cases very helpful if they're applied on a regular basis to keep good maintenance of those drains. But bar areas are very, very uh, difficult uh, unless, unless we can get access to all these areas. There's so many possibilities for where these flies could be breeding other than the drains. So again, that pest management provider should, should help you identify those, those areas. So we are getting a lot of questions on what you could use to clean the drain. Mm -hmm. So that's just a regular? It's just a regular detergent. You could follow it with a, a quat sanitizer. Uh, now, Watt sanitizers will kill fruit fly eggs, uh, but they need to be at generally the highest parts per million, around 800 ppm. And we can't claim that they're killing the eggs, even though we know that they do. From our research, uh, we found that quat sanitizers are good, ovicides as they're called, they will kill the fruit fly eggs. But good, good cleaning with a, a standard, uh, standard detergent, and then you can follow that up with a sanitizing rinse and then avoid the use of chlorine or uh, anything like that. It, it, is, it is a sanitizer in itself, but it's, it's more risky or dangerous to use. It wouldn't, we wouldn't really consider that to be an eco-friendly type chemistry. Okay, and is there any kind of outdoor chemical that can be used as a residual for pests that doesn't get impacted by rainstorms? Not really. <laughs> there's, a, there's a variety of granular type insecticides. Uh, they can be in the form of sand and, and such that, that are more durable. Uh, but it depends on what your target pest is. If it's cockroaches around the perimeter, we oftentimes like to use granular baits. Now these are baits that are, that are scattered uh, and they're labeled for the cockroaches around these facilities and the cockroaches will come out and eat them and eventually perish. Uh, that works, but again, you're right. It needs to be timed with the rain. I have a feeling this question is probably coming from Florida or, or maybe out uh, in Washington, someplace where they get a lot of rain. And unfortunately, we don't have any really good chemistry today that will hold up as well as others. We've got micro-encapsulated formulations that might last a little bit longer than, say, a wettable powder, but uh, nothing really a silver bullet uh, that we can use. How small does the screen mesh have to be to prevent fruit flies from bananas and onions? You know, I get the smallest screen size you can get, uh, and I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that up in my head. I'm sorry, but um, it would be something that's pretty obvious that they're not going to be able to get through. But the air can breathe. So work with your facilities on that. And then it also says, can fruit flies hitchhike on these products from vendors? Which products? The They're onions. And yes, yes, they can come in. Yeah, they can come in with those uh, those products. In fact, you go to the grocery store, and oftentimes you can see them uh, around the produce areas. I've noticed cockroach activity along the gaskets in our ovens in the bakery department. Warm, heated areas. Is that a prime breeding area? Yeah, if it's warm and they've got access to food, that would be that would be an area that they could reproduce. Yeah. So you want to look for those egg capsules. The gravid females, those, those are pregnant females, and then the nymphs. And those are all indication of a reproducing population. Okay. 
Okay, we have a couple more here. We are at a new facility. We brought NATS from the old facility. We have tried everything and many companies. We have a clean facility, dish room and around the soda fountain in the cafeteria have the most NATS. What can we do? So, yeah, we've got a, we've got a moist situation and not, I'm assuming when you say gnats, I'm assuming you mean like a, a fruit fly or something like that. And, um, you know, again, not without being there, it's pretty tough, it's pretty tough to answer that question. And fruit flies are among the most difficult pests to eliminate in food service. Um, and we've seen that, uh, they're, they're right up there with the, uh, you know, with the German cockroach and such, so very difficult. So finding the root cause is, is really what we need to do here, and without seeing the facility, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you too much information, but um, definitely don't just be looking down, not just at the floors or the drains, but they could be breeding up somewhere. And if it's the dish room, they could actually be breeding in the garbage disposal, possibly it could be in that, uh, or they could actually be breeding in some areas of the dishwashing machine. Very warm, humid area, and uh, certainly plenty of voids and opportunities for them to breed there. Any advice for eliminating regular flies? Yeah, so the, now we talked about fruit flies. Um, yeah, definitely the, the, the house fly is, is a problem. We're, we're, getting, we're getting, getting to low fly season here now as we get into the fall and the winter months, but these are flies coming in from the outside. The common house fly is the most, uh, one that we deal the most with in terms of filth flies. There's also blow flies, bottle flies that are classified as filth flies. And they're, garb they're, they're breeding in, in uh, uh, very unsanitary conditions. So in the case of a common house fly, uh, garbage and manure, especially in rural areas where you've got the farms and such around. So it's an outside-in approach for large flies. It starts on the outside, uh, making sure that we're doing our best to keep the doors closed, uh, you know, and, and good screening on the windows and things like that. And then there are some exterior treatments that can be done around the dumpster keeping good practices for, for the garbage storage, just as we showed for the garbage storage for the small flies, those principles also apply for large flies. Takes about two weeks for those flies to go from egg to adult, so they should not be breeding indoors unless you're not changing your garbage on a weekly basis or such. And then on the inside, there's some targeted insecticide treatments that can be done, uh, applied to their resting surfaces, and that needs to be done by your pest management uh, provider. And then there are a variety of fly lights that uh, uh, fly light systems that can be used uh, strategically placed where the fly activity is is most noted, and usually that's going to be about two meters up off the ground is where those need to be put, and they need to be the uh, capture the flies generally on a glue board or something similar to that, so that we're uh, we're capturing the the adult stage of the fly, and you can actually reduce the population of flies within these facilities using those techniques. So a variety of things that you can do, and again, most of this will be necessary from your pest management provider. Okay, looks like we have time for a few more questions. Okay. Are there documented cases of fruit flies causing foodborne outbreak in restaurants? No, no, there aren't, and that's again why I want to bring, bring it back to perspective here. We've shown that they're capable or have the potential to spread those pathogens, but it's very difficult to link a foodborne outbreak back to a particular pest situation. Uh, we've had situations where we've, we've had uh, foodborne outbreaks and pests present, be they rodents. Uh, sometimes it's birds up on the roof where their droppings are, are coming inside, so there's lots of possible sources. But to say there's a direct link, no, there isn't. But they are an indication of an unsanitary condition. So health inspectors, might look at the fruit fly as something that's very important for you to eliminate because it means that somewhere something is not as clean as it should be. Okay, and do fruit flies have any natural enemies that can be used to help control them? Uh, probably um, they do have some natural uh, enemies outside, such as spiders and things like that, but there's really no, um, uh, no biological approach, if you will, to eliminating fruit flies at this time. It's a great question because we do have natural enemies for house flies, parasites and such that are released on farms that, that can work very, very well. But today, uh, so far, we don't have anything like that for fruit flies. Good question. Okay, and we have an, we have an organic food production facility with cockroaches. 
We are currently practicing our pest control in-house. What are our options knowing insecticide applications are restricted? You're, you're spot on and uh, you, you need to have a plan in place. So if you're doing your own, your own pest control, it, that plan needs to be in writing. And it does involve using non-chemical steps at first. There are some approved insecticides uh, that are on the NOP list uh, and uh, National Organic Program, OMRI. And you can, you can look to that list. It lists uh, things such as diatomaceous earth, which is a type of dust. Uh, it can be effective on cockroaches, but the list is quite limited. It includes also some cockroach baits that can be used. All of this needs to be used first. You need to, an organic facility, you need to follow a certain hierarchy of what you're allowed to do because uh, you're right, it is more restricted. As a last resort, you can move to a, uh, another category of insecticide, but as soon as that pest is eliminated, you need to go back to your original plan and it needs to be very well documented. So there's a tier, tiered method or hierarchy that you need to follow uh, before you move to any, any type of insecticide like that. Excellent question. Okay, and so our time is almost out. Let's take one more question here. Okay. Are there any good insecticide products that a restaurant should be using to help eliminate fruit flies? Um, there's some that you can, and uh, you know, it's something that would have to be uh, like a 25B exempt type insecticide, which means it doesn't require EPA registration. Uh, there are states that do not allow commercial facilities to have pesticide applications within their facility without a licensed provider. So if you're in one of those states, and there's, there's several, several states, you cannot apply a pesticide yourself. So you should be aware of that. Uh, but if it's a 25B insecticide that didn't require uh, um, any type of registration with the EPA, you may apply those. Examples would be products that you can buy in a lawn and garden center that have essential oils. Uh, my warning to you on those is they're not necessarily very effective. There's no residual control. They will only kill insects on contact. Some of them are very high odor and some are actually flammable. So even though they're 25B exempt, it doesn't mean that they're any safer to use necessarily than the other insecticides. So my recommendation is that staff do not apply pesticides within their facility. Uh, that should be the job of your pest management provider. All right, thank you, Dr. Barquet. Thank you, Jen. A recording of this presentation will be available Friday, September 18th, so that's this Friday on the Ecolab.com site, backslash media center, backslash please presentation. And a reminder, the food safety webinars are the third Tuesday of every month with our next webinar on October 20th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And don't forget, Please answer the survey following today's webinar. This is also where you can request continuing education certificates. Thanks, everyone.